Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Trainers Forum presented by HRD Specialized Canine Training. This month, our guest trainer is Robin Grubel from Canine Census Foundation. Hi, Paul. Quick. Hey, Robin. Uh, a few things about Zoom uh, for those jo joining us for the first time. Um, don't log on to the course or these webinars more than 10 minutes before scheduled time because that just eats up memory and band space. Um, make sure your video is off and your audio is muted. Um, I'm certain everybody has very nice kitchens and so forth, but we don't need to see in your kitchen right now. And if you have questions. If you are on Zoom, you can go to um, the menu bar and you will see more. And from there, you have a chat box and you can submit questions that way. If you're on Zoom, you just got a message from me. And if you are on Facebook, if you're on Facebook watching live, you can just put your comments there into the live stream and I will try to pick those up as we go along, okay? So, also, at the conclusion of this, if you have any other questions or things like that, you can email those questions to hrdtrainersform at gmail, okay? So, a little bit about Robin. Robin and I have known each other since 2003, 2004. You know, it's been a little while. And... Got over that time, um, over that time, she has worked uh, uh, a number of dogs in this picture here. You see her with Canine Moses. Um, Moses, I believe, was her first introduction into working a lab. Um, <laughs> but Robin is a handler for... Nebraska Task Force One. She also is the founder and CEO of Canine Census Foundation. Uh, the predecessor to that was Paws of Life. And Robin comes to us from the world of education. And from there, uh, she takes an analytical approach to a lot of the things that we take for granted sometimes uh, as handlers and trainers. And, and she tries to find the, the interconnecting dots, so to speak. Um, so, Robin, I'm going to turn it over to you if you would like to say anything else about your background or your qualifications. Please do so. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Um, I started counting today. Um, it's amazing what you end up doing when you're like, huh, I've been doing this for almost 20 years and realize that Ember, my current dog, is the ninth dog that I've trained to do detection work. And um, I've covered everything from Border Collies to Dutch Shepherds to a mix. Um, Moses is my Yellow Lab Golden Retriever mix, who's now 13, and um, my retired Live Find FEMA dog. And my wonderful puppy is deciding she can't figure out where she'd rather be, so you might hear her in the background. Um, as Paul said, I come at this from a little bit more of an analytical side. 
um, by, I spent 20 years working at the nexus of academia and industry. So had to routinely figure out how to take really brilliant people on both sides of the aisle and get them to talk to each other. And so um, I also tend to be the type of person that does a whole bunch of research and which got me really, really interested in behavior analysis and learning processes. And so that's how I've started tackling and looking at my training. So we can move on because I so don't look like that because I don't get my nails done anymore. Um, it's amazing what living on a farm will do. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, harnessing the power of stimulus control and applying to contingency for reinforcement. This is something um, a lot of us do. We probably don't really know that we're doing it, uh, but I want to challenge people to be a little bit more deliberate on how they start thinking in this particular setting. And so, um, so what are we gonna cover? Which is on the next slide. Um, we're gonna cover what is a stimuli and how you use it. And then what actually is contingency for reinforcement. And once we define something, it makes it a whole lot easier to see and use. So stimuli are such things as physical events or things. So it's the change in air pressure. Um, we see this in our dogs that don't like thunderstorms. Um, there are things we see, things we touch, things we smell, things we hear. Anything that's going on around you becomes a stimuli. I will tell you the chocolate chip cookie dough that I know is upstairs in the refrigerator is a stimuli for me because I know it's there and I can swear it's calling my name to come and eat it. So as we start thinking about what our dogs are reacting to, we need to think about what the stimuli is that they are reacting to. And then learning is actually a change in behavior due to experience. So the stimuli is presented the dog actually learns this stuff in the sense of what gets me what I want. So when you start thinking about things like this, who controls the stimuli that our dogs are reacting to? Do they control it or do we control it? So when we start thinking about that, let's think about the examples. So one of the things I look at a lot is opening a crate door. Who controls opening the crate door? We do. Who controls what the dog does or could be doing before the crate door is opened? We do. The dog could be having an absolute hissy fit, but as long as the door is closed and they can't come out, they want to come out, they want to work. So we can control the, the opening of the crate door. It is a stimuli. You see dogs, as you approach the car, they start getting all excited because they put together you approaching the car, your stimuli, as, oh my God, I'm gonna get to go to work. Um, the releasing of a held behavior, your release word is a stimuli. You giving them cued, to a cue to lie down in that behavior is a stimuli. Odor accessibility is also an, a stimuli that we control. This is one of the things we talk about quite a bit in um, all of our classes is, are you actually putting odor in your car because if you're putting in your odor in your car, you're diluting the power of your stimuli. It, because you're actually teaching the dog that in this context, it doesn't matter. And one of the things that I think about with odor is 
I've been to a lot of trainings and you know what? I do this myself, right? Sometimes I've done it myself until I knew better. Um, I put odor in my car. I have odor sitting at the back of my vehicle when I get my dog in and out of my car. And every time I do that, the dog walks right past odor. I have successively taught my dog in this particular context, odor doesn't matter. Which if you think about sometimes when we are on searches and we park someplace right on top of a scene, an odor or the body is underneath the stairs parked 50 feet from our vehicle, what have we just taught our dogs that if it's within 50 feet of our car, it doesn't matter. So start thinking really, really hard about how you're handling the accessibility to odor for the dogs, what stimuli you're giving them, and then what behaviors they're learning that it actually, they actually do. So I'm, I'm taking stimulus control and I am pairing it for you with contingency for reinforcement because they actually work in my brain anyway. They work hand in hand. So when you start thought, thinking about contingency for reinforcement, I think about it as X plus Y equals Z. And so let's talk about defining what you want because if you define what you want, you know what the behaviors are so that you can actually reinforce your dog. So the next slide is Ember, who is my seven month, well, she'll be 18 months or she'll be eight months old on the 19th of um, this month. I'll go back one, Paul. Um, this is her operational definition of her trained final response. Now, Ember is my narcotics dog in training. And um, when I started working her um, at a month, at, well, I started working her the day I picked her up. So um, a, her de operational definition for her trained final response is that upon location of strongest odor, my dog will sit immediately because I can measure that. And when I mean immediately, I mean nose to source, sit. There's no two second wait, there's, there's nothing. Um, and she will stare at that location with a frozen body posture until the conditioned or primary reinforcer is given. So what's that mean? That means nose to odor, odor is the cue to sit. She will sit immediately. That is my stimuli. The condition, the contingency for reinforcement is that she will stare at that location with the frozen body posture until the conditioned reinforcer, which is a click or a whistle, um, or her primary reinforcer, which for her is a ball, is given. So either one of those two things can take place. Don't worry. We'll get through these. We've got videos. It'll be much more interesting and people can ask questions, I promise. So think about it this way. Stimulus control. Upon location of strongest odor, my dog will sit. And it's a fast sit because I can measure fast sits. Did it happen within one second or two seconds? Does it happen within three seconds? Does she not sit at all? Um, in a crate. And this, this one came out when I was thinking my dogs are required when I reach for the handle of their crate, they are required to lay down and wait quietly until released. I can put on leashes, I can put on harnesses, I can walk around to the front of my car, all sorts of things, and my dogs will lay in their crate and wait. I did not realize how handy this was until you always remember the one thing you forgot in your front seat, and I'm so worried about getting out and going out and searching that I forget to shut the crate door. 
and my dog's not jumping all over me to, to um, also jump in the car. And then the last one that I think about, because I'm working a lot on my five minute downstay, right? Is that in every environment, my dog will sit or lie down on cue. I will tell you that my dogs won't do this because we're constantly generalizing it. But in my head, it's one of those things that I strive for. So that's stimulus control. The question is, when presented with the stimuli, will they do the behavior? And then the contingency for reinforcement is, will they hold that behavior until released? So a lot of people start thinking about this in the sense of my dog will get to odor and it will do its trained final response. And then it will hold that trained final response until I get there to reinforce it odor. Now, one of the things that you really, really have to start thinking about when you look at things behaviorally is whatever behavior your primary reinforcer or your conditioned reinforcer, so your click, your ball, whatever, immediately follows is the thing that the dog thinks it's getting reinforced for. So if you're walking up to odor, your dog has done this few beautiful run up to odor, put its nose on odor and lay down stellar quick, right? I mean, oh my God, you want to take a video because it was beautiful. And you're running up there like a banshee, which hopefully you do. And you reinforce the dog two seconds after it's done that quick down. The behavior that you're actually reinforcing is the duration of the down behavior, not the quick down. And the other thing to think about is as you're running up there, you running up there, you reaching for your ball, you're doing all of this, this behavior, the dogs have learned that that's its conditioned reinforcer. So you may not think you are using a click or a yes, but you are. So my, my dogs will do the, the hold this behavior until I release you. So the sitting down until released, all of that sort of thing. So what does this take for you as a trainer to do this? Training is simple, but it's not easy. Oh, I, huh, look at that. I used an old PowerPoint, so now I'm finding out all the cool things that it does that I didn't know that it did. So consistency, this is the hardest one for the, for the human end of the leash, because we get very, very excited when our dogs seem to figure something out and jump ahead in their training. So we're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how, what I'm going to do now, right? We're going to go ahead and do the next three ones and see what happens. No, don't do that. I encourage people to start thinking about when they are building a behavior or training in a behavior in their dog to think in smaller slices your ability to define in very, very small increments what you want your dog to do is actually going to benefit you in the long run because if something goes wrong, you know where to go back to. The other thing I tell people to think about is a procedure. This is not a method, it's a procedure. So what does it, what's the difference between a procedure and a method? A procedure actually defines each individual behavior that you want the dog to do. And then how you teach the dog to do it depends on the dog. I have three dogs that have all been taught the same, using the same procedure, but each one of those dogs has learned significantly differently. Um, one was a Dutch Shepherd training to do a bark and hold for FEMA level work. Another one was my yellow lab who I had started in FEMA level work. And he looked at me and said, this isn't gonna work. So I switched him to explosives. And the third one is Ember who I've started as a puppy. 
each one has learned a sit and stare or their trained final response in a significantly different way. But the, the behaviors I expect out of them are the same, just how we got there is different. And this requires you as a trainer, because I hate to break it to everybody, if you're holding a leash, either you're training the dog or the dog's training you, to, no matter what's going on. If one of you is awake, somebody's being trained. And by the way, this applies to people and your cats and the cows and the whole, whole thing. So you have to understand the dance of timing, criteria, and rate and reinforcement. We tend to try and jump ahead a lot with raising our criteria too high and not having a high enough level of reinforcement. So um, I have hours, hours of video of all three of my dogs in a inside location building all of this behavior and building the behavior solid before we go out. The other thing to be able to really, really think about is the power of a reset. Please start thinking about the whole search chain of search, locate, report as the chain of behavior you need to protect and not allow any type of additional unwanted behavior in fringe. What does this mean? So think about my dog is going out and it's, we're doing box work or block work. And your dog's going along and it's putting its nose on odor and it's going and checking the next two blocks and then coming back to odor. This is a lack of stimulus control actually by odor. Once my not dog's nose goes to odor, it should sit. It should not be continuing to search. It shouldn't be doing anything else. It should sit and it should hold it until I release it. And so if your dog continues to move on down the line without sitting, go back to the beginning, stop, reset the dog. And so this, this takes all sorts of different forms. If people want, I can show a video of me doing it because let's just say my resets, you, got, you guys don't see because that ends up on the cutting room floor, along with the episodes of me banging my head against the wall because um, there's something I'm doing to not make things clear. So resets help you um, keep that whole chain very, very clean. Knowing your dog's motivators. So when I start talking about motivators in the literature, they do not refer to them as drives. Drive is a construct. So this is what motivates the dogs to do things, right? My labs like to retrieve. They also really, really like food. And so I use that depending on where I'm at and what I'm doing. I can use a combination of the two um, to play fetch, to um, they may not want to hold things in their mouths. My Dutch Shepherd would rather play tug, right? He, he loves to possess his toy. And so I can use that as a motivating factor for my toy. If we start thinking about it as a drive and start really thinking about what motivates the dog to do the behavior you want it to do, it helps you really start thinking about how can I use that mat a motivator in innovative ways to make this reinforcing for my dog. So <clears throat> lastly, this is the... Um, since I've been talking almost for 25 minutes. Um, I put this link in here so Paul could take us out to the YouTube channel where I uploaded a bunch of the videos of the dogs. And Paul, I'll just kind of leave it up to you to pick up whichever video you want to pick up and I can talk about what, we, what I was doing in that particular 
one. I put Ember's entire progression out there, um, starting from week one all the way up to, um, let me see what we did last weekend when I exposed her to odor for the very, very for her to her target odor instead of her training odor. Does anybody have any questions? Rotten fruit. Everyone, we should have switched over to the YouTube channel. Hopefully everybody can see that now. I can. Okay. So so if you start with the M, we'll just start off with yeah. You pull which up, which up, which one, ever one you want to start with. So this is Ember at sixteen weeks. So keep in mind we've been doing this um, for at this point we've been doing sit and stairs for eight weeks. Um, we've been doing it in multiple different locations. Um, we are working on a piece of Kong. And why do I, um, I did not invent this. This comes from the um, Scandinavian Working Dog Institute. Um, yes, Mandy, I see you. Can we please see your resets? Um, so I was lucky enough when I came across the Scandinavian Working Dog Institute uh, videos that they had on their YouTube channel, to have a friend of mine who is a PhD in behavior analysis and uh, learning processes living with me. She lived here for about three months when we offered some chicken workshops. And um, she walked through all of the learning theory behind how this worked. And so I was really, really lucky. So um, you can see here, I am starting to wiggle the leash. And Ember has learned because that if I just sit there and hold, actually the more distractors my mom throws at me, that means I'm right. And so I will um, not move. You'll actually see her um, now, she'll actually sink into her sit. So as I'm watching, um, as we're watching some of these videos, so let's just say Ember goes up to this particular video uh, or up to this particular Kong piece and I start humming right? And she turns and she looks at me. My resets are predicated by a, a no reward marker. Nope, that's not what I wanted. And um, it would be, um, at that point, I bring her back. She's only seven months old. And I restart her almost immediately. So it's a spin around in a circle. Here you go, go. And um, my older dogs who have figured this out a little bit, and, and you know what I will do, um, Mandy and Emma, um, over the weekend, because it is 65 degrees this weekend in Iowa, oh my God, I will set something up um, and videotape me with the intent and hope that something, I can do something that my dogs are gonna turn and break whatever they're doing. And I will show you how I reset my dog. How I reset Nico varies distinctly different than how I do it with Dash, than how I do it with Ember. So this is Ember last month, um, working in the middle of Menards, which is a big box store. Um, and probably one of the few times we've ever worked on leash in this type of an environment, and it happened to be President's Day. So the next one, there were like five people in our aisle. 
And um, at, at six months old, I was extremely happy with her. Um, so Emma, you were asking about teaching a stand and stare and about versus a sit and stare. Absolutely. All you have to do is um, catch that behavior prior to sit them sitting, right? So um, Paul, the next one that you um, pull up, have it be the, the week one, um, Ember week one. So, <clears throat> And this, this particular video was just a conglomeration of her. I, I mean, I picked her up. This was the day after I picked her up. And so she's learning to do all sorts of new things. And um, use you can use their toy and have them just stare at the toy. And then as soon as they do the behavior that you want them to do, whether it's a stand or stare or a sit and stare, the toy moves. So that first little clip was her learning how to do a sit and stare with food under a lid. And you put it in a, on the floor. If you really want to start a stand, start it with it in your hand at nose height. Um, and that will make it easier, right? So this is about defining your behavior so entire, so small that you know what the dog is learning to do. So this is, this is still Ember in week one, we're now home. And one of the things you may not have noticed, at a minimum, she was doing sit and stares, looking at a little tiny lid in a minimum of four different locations within her first week. And they weren't long durations, it was really, really fast. So, other questions. Now she will actually sit and stare. I can walk around behind her. I can do all sorts of things while she is um, sitting and staring at odor. Um, I'm not quite as good as the Scandinavian working dog guys. I haven't pushed it to the point where I can walk up and pet her. Uh, but this is the type of thing. Now, one of the things I'm going to be working on with her, both Nico and Dash will do it. I can put their reinforcer on the ground. They will go past their reinforcer. For Nico, it's Kong on a rope. For Dash, it's a little chuck it ball on a tab. They go past their reinforcer in order to go find odor because they understand contingency for reinforcement. So this is this past weekend. Um, we, it took me about um, three exposures to odor to get Ember to understand that I now want you to search for this odor instead of your Kong. It's called a stimulus reversal. That's all it is. And um, this is actually, yeah, this is her third exposure to odor just because we had to do um, a, a couple of interesting in interesting things. There should be some more videos. I don't know if you can't see them all. Hit the videos tab. I'm only getting these. Let me see. Huh. There we go. Okay. So um, play the Nico um, January 5 of 19. So uh, bottom left. Yep. So this is actually Nico's seventh exposure to target odor. And um, one of the things that's really interesting about this is um, one, he added the down. The down is not required. If you catch him on a rubble pile, he will be standing. He will not lie down. And uh, two, the other interesting thing is, is when I first set this up, um, my phone is sitting on top of the cadaver cooler, as you can tell by the flies, right? And we are downwind. And so it resulted in a really, really cool video of him barking at my phone. 
And um, I've got the toy the entire time. You can't hear it because I have removed this, the sound, but he will stay there and he will hold his barking down until I click. Um, I now use a whistle. Um, what you also cannot see is that I've got odor in a canning jar laying out in the middle of the field. And I've got six other jars that look exactly like it, all with um, stuff in them. Some of it's distractor odor, some of it's them are blank, all sorts of things. And <clears throat> I kick those around so he actually has to do a discrimination exercise to go find the correct odor. Um, I did learn when you're moving your jars, make sure you move the clean jars and not the dirty jar, um, just as a FYI. And you also see that I change my location practically every time that I do this. Now also watch if you're going through and I happen to be in the videos, how I start him is exactly the same every single time, consistency. And so this one, he takes a little bit longer, lays down, barking nicely away from me, click, come back and get your toy. Unfortunately, I was watching this the other day and I'm like, oh my gosh, we had such beautiful outs. Uh, we don't have these beautiful outs anymore because I have not been working on them. Um, so that is my issue. And he is at the point where, though, where I can have him come back I can send him out to go look for odor and he will find odor with the toy in his mark mouth. He'll spit out his toy. He'll bark at odor and I will click and he will get his toy back if I really need him to. So, um, other questions from anybody. I'm going to move this back to the other format. Okay. Go out, watch the YouTube videos, shoot me questions. That's awesome. That would be great. Um, article indication is something you do. Um, when you ask about an article indication, um, my explosives dog runs on shell casings and guns. And so it's the same exact alert as his explosives alert. Um, so what I will tell you is my, all dogs have what's called a var variable um, or differential reinforcers. So if you think about your reinforcers that fall into the A, B, or C category, A is like, oh my God, off the planet. Um, B is, yeah, that's okay. And C is like, meh, it's all right, but you know, whatever. Um, you can use those in your training. And so my dogs, um, so Nico, for example, since I can't get him to out right now without a big long discussion, um, if I am doing multiple uh, sources back to back to back, he now gets cheese sticks, which in his world of reinforcers is a B reinforcer, a, a level B reinforcer, a level C reinforcer is um, dog biscuits. A level, his level A reinforcer is um, playing, is getting his toy, and the A plus reinforcer is playing tug with mom. So um, I can use all of those as I go through to reinforce whatever behaviors that I want. And your strongest behaviors will come from um, those that are on a continuous reinforcement schedule. So Robin, over on Facebook, 
somebody asked, have, uh, or Steve asked, have you started car searches yet? Um, yes, all of my, um, Ember will do an entire car search. That's actually one of the requirements I have before putting her on actual odor is she actually had to be able to do the scenes of cars. Um, so she, yes, she's doing car searches already. All, all of my dogs do car searches. And, and I don't know if, if I missed this and, and trying to jump back and forth and keep pages moving and everything, but on resets, I know that I teach with res resets. It's basically a three strikes and you're out. Um, it's time for, you know, both of us to separate. Dog needs to be kenneled for a moment. I need to think about what I'm actually asking my dog to to do and, right. and so forth. Um, are, are you teaching anything different or have you used anything different besides that kind of three strikes you're out? Um, it, w it totally depends on the context. So, um, what I will tell you is that if, if I see a dog struggle more than five times, I am not, I have either jumped too high in my criteria that they have no idea what I'm supposed to do, what they're supposed to do, or there's something that has broken down and the behavior is not it all comes back down to I've done something to my criteria so it doesn't work. And so this could mean anything. Um, I saw it this weekend with Ember. Um, she, she is the type of dog that if I reset her more than three times, she actually is like, dude, I'm not going to offer anything because I'm done. And so I have to go think about what I did wrong that she doesn't understand. Um, and let me tell you, this does not mean I go back to, let's make it really, really easy for you. This goes back to where is my odor placed? And, and her problem was the fact that I accelerated it too quickly when transferring her to target odor. Now, Dash is a great example of a dog who... I spent a long time trying to get him to understand, no, all I need you to do is go up to this thing and sit and stare at it. You don't have to search for it. You just have to sit there and hold your sit. I all, and I learned he can't be grabbed by the collar. I have to write, grab a tab. And I would reset him up to 10 times before I would start asking, what do I need to be doing differently? He's a different dog. My resets are, and my behaviors are sliced so thin that um, let's, let's just imagine this. You're in your living room or the place that you train all the time, your garage. The odor that you want the dog to alert on or the Kong or whatever it is, is literally standing or sitting on the floor two feet away. If my dog from its sitting position, when I say search, can get up, walk two steps, sit and stare at that Kong, and I can sing the national anthem, then I know that I'm okay to move on. If my dog can't even do that in my garage without any other distractions, there is no way they're going to do that out in the middle of the woods or in the middle of um, Chicago with the mounted patrol walking by, <laughs> right? Which happened to me like two weekends ago. So um, just when I, and so when I talk about a reset, it's used as a, it's used as, a, a negative reinforcement. It is the removal of a positive. 
you have to do this whole chain of behavior in order to get your, your primary reinforcer. Um, how often do I work a job, a dog? Um, if I was a good stellar trainer <laughs> and the rest of my life didn't get in the way, Ember would actually be ready to certify um, at seven months old. And keep in mind, she's doing narcotics. Um, so that it, it's different than uh, cadaver work and some of the search work stuff because there's a lot more maturity required um, for me anyway. And remember, I'm keeping Ember. It's not like I'm selling her to somebody. Um, I, and when you say work a dog, I start thinking about working my dog in the sense that odor work two to three times a week, environmental socialization and um, confidence building two to three times a week. We're also doing not structured obedience, but I call it public access work, walking nicely on a leash. Let's go walk out in the park. Let's go learn to ignore other dogs. Um, that is two to three times a week. They get a day off. I also, because I have the dogs that I do, I also try and run them um, a couple miles every day. I have a mule, I don't run. Um, and I mean, like an UTV, not a mule, like with big ears. I've got a <laughs> UTV. I have miniature donkeys, I'm not riding them anywhere. Um, so Emma said she's. Um, so here's one of the things that I will tell you about teaching car searches. If you're doing odor work on car searches, take a magnet that has the sticky back on them, slap a cotton swab, you know, the flat cotton pads that you get in the makeup section, cut around it, throw it in with your odor. It'll get infused with odor. You can stick those in the cracks of the car and that will teach the dogs to search the more higher the higher probability areas such as your seams now one of the ways that you start vehicles is let's say you have and this is one of the nice things that's um um nice with using kong pieces because i can take a kong piece the size of um, half of my pinky fingernail and squish it all sorts of places into car car parts that the dogs can't see and that but they can still smell the rubber um, so um, I will put three to five pieces of Kong on the car and what happens is and that's one of the ways that you see the dog spending so much time searching those brick walls. That's because when we started the whole process, there are five pieces of Kong in that brick wall. So every, every time they start sniffing, they're gonna hit a piece of Kong. And then you pull that piece of Kong and they go back to sniffing. So they, they're getting a high rate of reinforcement for continuing to sniff the wall. So um, yes, Emma, that's why I don't use food. Um, and I don't hide food on my cars to teach crack searches. Um, Mandy, um, a tea bag in a container, doesn't matter the Kong is a favorite toy for her. Um, so I would tell you switch to the Kong just mainly for the reason that you can cut a Kong down into little, little tiny pieces fast and um, it allows you to hide that odor in all sorts of places. Um, it does not matter if a Kong is a favorite toy for her or not. Um, actually, Ember doesn't search for her favorite toy is not a Kong. Hers is actually just a little chuck it ball. Um, my next puppy will be started a little bit differently that the Kong will probably be an odor. But Dash was started on um, Anise in a tin. And then I just moved him to Q-tips, just like the nose work people do. And Nico was actually started on a piece of his Frisbee. 
So I will still try and get videos of my resets so people can understand what is going on. Then they can see the dog make a mistake and um, then how I handle it. Any other questions? Paul, did you have any questions that you were dying to ask? I did not have any okay. questions that I was dying to ask, but I do want to take a moment and say thank you for joining us tonight. Um, would also like to encourage everybody to go out, check out the Canine Census website, check out the courses we've got planned in partnership yes. this year. Because Paul and I um, and, and the whole um, crew are going to spend lots of time together this year. So we hope you will all join us. Very much so. Um, also, uh, go out and um, check out these videos that are on YouTube. Um, uh, I'm checking on Facebook right now for our audience that's tuning in there. Um, you did get a thank you for the car explanations, but uh, no questions have shown up from there. Um, when are we coming to Australia? Um, actually, that, that has been talked about several times. So, uh, you know what? Just I, let us know. And we'll, we can schedule that. <laughs> you know, watch uh, for the 2021 schedule. Um, so you never know where we might show up. <laughs> so uh, I do want to go ahead and introduce our, our guest for next month. It's going to be uh, William Dodson or Bill Dodson as most of us know him as. Um, and he's been around. Um, for for what a short minute? What did you say, Robin? Uh yeah, it's not very long. So, um, but um, yeah, we're we're happy to come wherever to do uh, workshops and, and seminars and so forth. So, but if you have any additional questions you can email me directly at psmartin at hrdspecializedcanine.com if it's something directly to robin i will make sure to get that over there to her make sure to check out hrdspecializedcanine.com we've got a good number of webinars coming up and uh, several interesting classes coming up. Uh, looking forward to being in April in Iowa in April with Robin. And April starts off this whole whirlwind of events between, <laughs> between the two of us. So. Looking forward to seeing everybody in person, hopefully over the next year. So thank y'all and have a great evening. Good luck in your searches and stay safe. <laughs>